at the risk of extending the conversation about who and who isn't here, and I'm delighted we've got the panel we have, I do want to express disappointment that we don't have a Minister for London. We know we're talking about a cost of living crisis, but this is really an income crisis, an inequality crisis, and we know the effects that this is having on Londoners, so I do think it's negligent to not be here. But I want to move on because I want to thank the guests that are here. Um, Torsten, can I begin with you? There's been a lot of discussion, um, particularly in the media and from the government, around the financial black hole. And that's led to very familiar conversations about treating finances like household budgets or debits on credit cards. And it's starting to feel like it's setting the table for austerity 2.0. What lessons do you think there are for London uh, from the last 12 years of Conservative government in how to run uh, finances responsibly? Um, that's a big question. Um, uh, so I offer a number of um, reflections. So the first, the big picture reflection is that um, Britain as a whole has got poorer. Okay, that is what a energy global energy shock, um, driven particularly through gas markets, means for an energy importing country, which is what we are. And so a lot of the subsets of what we're discussing at the moment, views on public spending levels, views on taxation levels. Uh, views on energy support, views on wages, profit levels, all of those are subsets of a wider question, which is the country has become poorer. How do we wish to distribute the pain that that causes? What's the balance between employers paying it and workers paying it? That's why you're going to see more strikes happening over the course of this year than you've seen in recent past, because that's what happens when you're in a high inflation environment and everyone needs to kind of calm down about that. That's just the world as it exists in the real world. And similarly, the choices on tax and public spending become more acute in an era where the country is becoming poorer, because that is actually a subset of deciding, do we want to become poorer by having worse public services, or do we want to become poorer by um, paying more taxes and having lower private levels of consumption? Now, within that, then, there are lots of important choices to make about how well you do that. So most obviously, you need to take into account the very real distributional effects of an energy shock and so your job of the pub, the job of the of policy makers is to make sure those most acutely affected by that cost of living shock those on lower incomes who have a higher energy bills they um, need to be protected from it and then when it comes to your views on the balance between public spending and taxation then given that this is a country that's just been through 10 years of austerity the idea that you're going it's going to be as easy to cut public spending now as it was in 2010 is for the birds it's much easier to cut it at the beginning of a period of austerity than it is at the end of it and so that's why when the chancellor's looking at the package that he has to announce on the 17th then I think it is inevitable, if that's to be a remotely credible package, that tax will need to pay a much bigger part uh, than, I think is, uh, than I think is part of the conversation. Now, you're then setting that within a wider context, which is on the macroeconomics of this. Do we need to balance the books? Um, I, I mean, I, I have an un annoyingly nuanced view. I know some people want to say, like, it's all about filling the hole right now. And then another load of people want to say there's no such thing as a fiscal constraint. Have you met MMT? I've got my I've got my like macro conspiracy theory. I'm afraid countries do face financial constraints. They're not the same constraints as household budgets at all, but they do face financial constraints. I think the really important thing to understand is that today is not the same macroeconomic environment as we faced in 2010. And most importantly, that's because you've got an independent central bank that is raising interest rates because it's saying to us the economy is operating at full capacity. Now, it doesn't matter whether we agree with them or not, okay? If that is their judgment, and we've decided that they're an independent central bank, that means that if we try to use fiscal policy to boost the economy, which we should be doing for distributional reasons when it comes to the energy package, they will raise interest rates by more than they otherwise would to try and squeeze out that support for the economy to make sure it doesn't grow any faster because they're worried about the effect on inflation. So in that environment, the trade-offs are more real. And the second reason the trade-offs are more real is because we, our balance of payments deficit is huge because we're importing gas and gas has just got more expensive. And that's another way of saying the UK, which is always borrowing from abroad in the recent past, needs to do a lot more of that right now. So I don't be flippant about the fact that we do face real financial constraints and they are more acute now than they definitely than they were in 2010 when interest rates were going down, not up large amounts of QE was taking place. That is not the world we live in. The central bank is trying to sell assets and is trying to raise interest rates right now. But that doesn't mean that we should be gung-ho, given that there's on the scale of consolidation, because it's very uncertain. 
like you know we have estimates of what we think the consolidation required is the OBR is going to give the government its one on the 17th and explain it to all of us all of us providing those kind of estimates should be very honest about the scale of uncertainty involved and so you sh I think you don't want to go totally overboard and say I definitely need to do an absolutely huge consolidation right now on the basis that we don't know what the long-term situation is. I can't tell you what geopolitics is going to do to gas prices. That's the thing that's going to drive the depth of the recession that's going to happen next year. Can I just focus us in there? So I really appreciate the nuance. I think there was a lot in that answer because it was a big question. Um, I think we're in danger of uh, learning some of the wrong answers from this crisis, so particularly around borrowing. Now, borrowing for un unfunded tax cuts is clearly not desirable. Yeah. Borrowing for investment and green investment in particular, I think, is somewhere we should be going. So on the point of tax cuts, Green Party policy is actually uh, for a wealth tax, so a 1% tax on the wealthiest 1%, which would raise about £75 billion pounds a year. Now, what do you think... Um, a wealth tax would mean for Londoners, particularly if it could open big money to make sure we're insulating every home, for instance, that needs it. And what difference would that make, particularly for poorer Londoners? Um, so to take those elements in turn, um, uh, Britain does need to have a higher level of public investment than it has maintained for lots of the last few decades, particularly the 1990s, when basically Britain decided to do zero public investment. There's a case that's needed for public services. It's needed to support growth. Public investment obviously supports science and R&D spending as well. Uh, and it is important for net zero. And there is no route to plausibly staying on target for our net zero ambitions in the 2020s without significant public investment driving our retrofitting program in particular. So that is completely right. And there is no alternative to that. Low income households are not going to retrofit their homes. Their b incomes are far too low given the costs that are required to do that even before we start putting in the heat pumps just to get the insulation in. So they can't. So that, so you need that to happen and we need whatever consolidation plans the government comes forward with not to make that impossible. And so we shouldn't treat that kind of spending differently. Now, uh, separately, that I agree, we do need to see tax taking a lot of the burden of um, some of the difficult choices that are happening in the near future. Within that space, uh, I think a moving to a net wealth tax is, again, not going to happen in the foreseeable future and brings with it all kinds of design considerations. I would, again, focus on things that plausibly can happen in the wealth tax space, which should be, and the big picture, remember, the reason why wealth should be doing more work in the taxation space is because wealth, even though incomes haven't grown in Britain very fast over the last 15 years, wealth has been growing pretty much nonstop since the 1980s which is largely through asset price accumulation, which is basically housing, some uh, pension increases too. The taxation that falls on that growing household wealth has been zero. So with five, around 5% 5 of GDP being collecting in tax from wealth taxes, no growth despite the tax to G the wealth to GDP ratio going from about three to about eight times over the course of that time. So yes, we should. Within that space, you should be focusing on capital gains taxes, particularly on allowances and on the rates and on a lot of the exemptions, which are completely indefensible. Within the inheritance tax space, it's completely mad, not in London because you haven't got much many fields, but you know, we exempt, why does Dyson own lots of fields? because they're inheritance tax exempt, right? It's not because he loves fields, it's because he'd like to not pay inheritance tax and you don't pay inheritance tax if you're a farmer, which I promise you, Mr. Dyson is not. So there are, there are lots of things in the wealth tax space we should get on with. Similarly on property taxation, I've got a long list of things we should definitely be doing. We should be doing all of those and all of those are much easier to do than trying to introduce a net wealth tax. Thank you very much. And particularly around your support for wealth taxes, you know, London is one of the most prosperous cities in the world. And the fact we've got a cost of living crisis is shameful. These are political choices. Um, Deputy Mayor, if I can move on to you, it's picking up from what Torsten was saying there, particularly around uh, poorer Londoners are not going to retrofit their own homes without support. And I think we'd definitely agree on that. I want to look at communal heating systems as an aspect of that. Now, people living in these buildings do not benefit from the energy price cap. And sometimes they're having quite steep uh, rises with 10 times the previous sum. What steps does the government need to do to take control of this outrageous situation of communal heating uh, to make sure that people are supported? So this is something that was um, uh, raised by Tom Copley. Um, uh, I chair a, um, a monthly uh, cost of living working group which has representation from different de deputy mayors from across the building. Um, and Tom um, raised with me at that point the, is the issue of communal heating. Um, and he, um, I believe, is about to write, I think he was going to write, um, uh, to the government to say that this was something which was unfeasible and that um, 
he would need to see some changes on because it's it's I, I guess it's one of those there are many issues which when we're talking about um, the way in which people can access benefits or access support there are so many that fall through those cracks and communal heating those living in those um, uh, properties are the ones who tend to to fall between those cracks so I can assure you it's something that uh, that Tom uh, Copley as Deputy Mayor for Housing is um, acutely aware of and is hoping to develop um, well develop conversations with government about ways that they can work together to try to address it. Thank you. Um, if I can move now to the lifeline tariff that the, the mayor announced. Now, I'm really interested in this policy. It feels like it draws on some good green thinking and has that kind of systemic approach. Now, we need to ensure energy costs are fair, and this policy goes some way to making sure that would be implemented. But what steps have been actually taken to consider how feasible this approach would be? And how would you see a policy being put in place if it got support? Um, okay, so on the lifeline tariff, I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately going to have to do that thing, which I know many of you in this room do not like me doing or anyone doing, uh, which is that I'm going to have to defer to the Deputy Mayor for Environment um, and Energy, uh, Shirley Rodriguez, because this is something that she has advised the Mayor that he needs to uh, um, uh, ask for. So any development or work around it is something that her team would have responsibility for. So I'm sure she could um, give you some uh, further detail on what she's doing on that. I think that's a fair response. With my final few mi minutes, I just want to turn onto a slightly different topic. Now, we often talk about these short-term fixes that we need for the cost of living crisis, and I totally get that many people in London and around the UK are really feeling it right now. So it is totally correct that we protect the most vulnerable. I do think we need those long-term visions as well. And um, for the years that I've been elected to the Assembly in the last two, I've been talking about universal basic income repeatedly, bringing motions to it, and thank you for the time that you've spent with me. This comes off a long tradition of Greens in the Assembly and nationally talking about universal basic income. We've been banging on about it for decades, and we will not stop until we get there. Now, I know an easy solution is to say we need short-term fixes, and I agree with that, which is why I'm not acknowledging that up front. But we also need that long-term vision and strategy. Now, the thing that's changed since we've last had this conversation is Andy Burnham, Manchester Mayor, is now talking about um, universal basic income a lot. I was about to say proportional representation. He's talking about that too, which is great. But um, he's talking about universal basic income. Um, is the mayor working with him on this to make sure that we can get a universal basic income in London? Um, so um, uh, it was rightly pointed out that the mayor has signed a joint letter that um, uh, Andy Burnham and others have signed around um, asking the government to consider funding a pilot. I think the issue, um, the issue for me is that we know that were a pilot of this nature to take place in London, it would be an incredibly costly pilot and it's something that we definitely would need additional support to be able to fund to do. Um, and I'm, I suspect that this is part of the reason why the mayor signed the letter and why so many individuals signed the letter to ask the government if they would consider funding um, uh, a pilot of this nature. I am though, as you as you will know, because we have had this conversation, I am um, very concerned about those who are on the lowest incomes right now. Um, and yes, we do have to have long-term solutions. I do um, still feel that the welfare system is where a lot of this um, reform could feasibly take place. We have a, a welfare system in, in our country which is supposed to provide a safety net for those on the lowest incomes, those who fall on hard times, those who are unable to work for, for whatever reason. And unfortunately, we have a system where around, um, well, certainly last year in London, there were around two, million, two billion pounds of means tested benefits that went unclaimed. So we do need to do more to ensure that those on the lowest incomes are making claims for what they rightly um, uh, uh, should be claiming in order to maximise their incomes. And in the short term, I do strongly believe that the uprating of benefits in line with inflation, um, the increasing awareness for those on lowest incomes of what they are entitled to is one of the best ways to try to ensure that those who are at risk of destitution frankly are able to get through this winter um, as far as ubi however is concerned um, uh, funding a pilot is something that you know we should look into and think about anything anything at all that can help low-income londoners be able to avoid poverty is is important i really appreciate that um, amount of time so, so sorry to interrupt yeah. but it, no, um, the mayor's okay. own research shows it will uh, lift a hundred uh, hundreds of thousands of londoners out of poverty so i'll join you in lobbying the government thank you